just there. There he is. So I shall stop now and hand over to the one and only Ross Wintle with user experience. It's for everyone. Da -da -da. Was that big enough for you? <laughs> Right, now I've just got a wheel off, so please don't worry, I'll hand the mic over to you. You want the mic, do you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I wasn't expecting such an enormous build-up. I've had a great chat with Mick in the run-up to this. I did get out of the way of the screen. Um, and yes, uh, I, it, hopefully it'll be amazing. I certainly won't tell you everything there is to know about user experience, but we'll have a go at telling you something. Um, who am I? I am Ross Wintle. Uh, a few of you know me or have met me this weekend, which has been great. Uh, I'm at Magic Roundabout. That's the actual roundabout, not the cartoon series. Um, I am a software developer and a technology and communications consultant. And I work for myself under the name Oikos. Oikos, it's Greek. Apologies for that. And I work as part of a virtual agency called Hands Up. And in both cases, we work primarily with charities and NGOs, trying to use technology, specifically a lot of WordPress, um, to do good in the world. I have a quick, quick request uh, to uh, you all, which is that you need to be a little bit nice to me today, and there's a few reasons for that. The first is that it's my first ever conference talk, so uh, hopefully it'll be great, feedback welcome, um, but please be nice. Please be nice, because uh, who had a great lunch? Oh, one person. <laughs> One person had a great lunch. OK. Hopefully, you've all had a great lunch. Uh, this is what's commonly known as the graveyard shift amongst speakers, where you've all just had lunch, your bellies are full, all of the blood that was in your head is now down digesting food in your stomach. And this means that you're all basically a bunch of like conference zombies who are sleeping. Uh, zombie pictures are a bit like uh, dodgy for a family audience, mostly, so you get a sleepy cat. Hopefully, that's good. Please be nice, because I have baby brain. Did I get an R? Ah, oh, thank you. This is Ada. She was born nine weeks ago. She's lovely. She does keep me awake. I don't have much sleep. I don't have much spare time. And both of those things are good things to have if you're doing your first conference talk on a big stage. I'm also, despite all of those things, um, not a subject matter expert in the thing that I'm going to talk to you about. I am not a UX designer. In fact, I'm not a designer of any sort, which is why my slides are a bit rubbish. Um, so, but the whole point of this talk is that you don't have to be a subject matter expert to be involved in UX design. I do have some credentials, however. I've always, from, a, from my university days, been um, really interested in psychology. Um, I've always been interested in human-computer interaction and how people behave. Like, if you think computers are really interesting and you want to know how they work, have a look at people and try and work out how people work because they're really interesting too. And that interest has carried through 12 years of working in software engineering and IT. And during the last five years as a freelance website developer, um, it's become increasingly important to be interested in those things uh, because of this thing called user experience, which I'm hoping to tell you something about. So there was a great book that came out uh, in January uh, by a guy called Joel Marsh. It's called UX for Beginners. If you're a beginner with UX, it's a great book to read. And he's validated a lot of the, the thoughts that I've had uh, about preparing this talk. And he says, UX is 90% how you think and 10% what you design. Um, and this is one of the reasons why UX is for everybody, because we're all capable of thinking and we're all capable of changing the ways that we think and the questions that we ask our clients and the things that we create in the world. So if we can change the way that we think a little bit, maybe we can improve what we, what we make uh, for the better for everybody. I actually rephrased this slightly as UX is 90% asking questions and 10% having the answers. I like that a bit better. Um, and at the end, if there is time, there's quite a lot of content, um, we'll have a Q&A, which I'm hoping will be a bit more like Q&A, because there may not be answers, but we'll, we'll have some discussion if there's time. <coughs> I have a slight cough, I apologize. So, the full title of this talk, when I submitted it, was User Experience, it's for everyone, it's important, and it's really hard. And as part of the user experience of submitting the talk, the title got truncated to User Experience, it's for everyone. And I'm kind of glad it did, because if I advertised a talk that was about something that was really hard, there probably wouldn't be half as many people here. Um, but the fact that it's really hard 
doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. There are lots of things in the world that are hard that we do. We send people into space and we drive cars. Driving a car is actually really quite hard. Um, but these are the three things I want to try and convince you of today. We'll top it with some information about what user experience is, and we'll tail it with some things that you can do and read as you go away to try and start your own thought processes about user experience. So first of all, what is user experience? <laughs> this is a terrible slide. I, I ran this presentation past a friend of mine. I did some user testing. I do do my own user experience work sometimes. Um, and he said, Ross, that's a terrible slide. It looks like, like a maths lecturer's blackboard or something. So my users didn't like this, so I changed it. Here are a few definitions. Um, UX uh, means user experience. It means the experiences that your users will have. Um, but it's also used fairly interchangeably with UXD which is user experience design. And user experience design is a process by which you create user experiences. Um, I want to distinguish this from UI, which is user interface, which are the things that you see on the screen. So the user experience design process is the process by which you determine what goes on the screen. This was one of the first things I found out about user experience as a piece of terminology which is that user, in, user interface is what you see and user experience is how you feel. That doesn't quite capture the whole of what user experience is um, because there are other things alongside how you feel, like what you remember or what your perceptions of a brand are or like with accessibility, there's all sorts of things that come with accessibility that aren't just how you feel, there are how do you get places and how do you do things. Joel, in his book, UX for Beginners, says, makes this a little bit more succinct. He says, your user interface is what you see, and user experience is why you see it. It's the process that drives how you create things in a way which will create positive user experiences. Here's another quote from a guy called Havoc. Uh, I've referenced him in small writing. Uh, if you see small writing and can't read it, uh, see, see the slides afterwards. I will post them somewhere. Uh, he says the best UX will often be no user interface at all. And does anyone know what, oh, it's a bit of a small picture. Does anyone recognize this kind of thing? Does anyone have one of these? Does anyone know what this does? What's that? Reset your, reset your mileage. It does reset my mileage. This is a multi-function button, would you believe? It not only resets my mileage, it changes the clock on my car. And if you were in the UK two weeks ago, we put our clocks forwards. Um, which, so this button, this is a piece of user interface, okay? There is a user experience that goes with that user interface, um, which innocent drinks in a very small writing, I'm sorry, um, sum up by things like the iPhone or smartphones in general, um, they update themselves like magic. It's like you don't have to do anything. There is an interface for changing the time, but it does it for you. Um, whereas your car clock needs some kind of like strange randomly assigned combination of button presses and swearing in order to just move the clock forward, so much so that you generally give up and just wait six months until the clocks go back again. That's a user experience. Um, user experience is about making users effective. So users have goals when they come and use the things that you create, and organizations that create those things also have goals. Um, hopefully, with the things that you're creating, these two things overlap a little to the happy place. Uh, and um, that's the area that UX needs to try and enlarge and target. So UX tries to make the crossover between those two things as big as possible, and then make the things that exist in that space as easy as possible to do, so that both users and organizations are effective. UX is about user journeys. Here's a website, where well, it looks like a homepage, Again, very small, I apologize. Um, and uh, it might not be your homepage. Actually, who, who, when's the last time, did somebody this week visit bbc.co.uk, the homepage? Oh, a few people. Has anyone ever visited, any developers in the room, ever visited the homepage of stackoverflow.com? One, two, three, maybe. Not many, but you get the idea. There are certain types of website where you don't very often visit the homepage you get to it through other places. 
So the first step of a user journey might be how you get there. Um, this might be found in a Google search. It might be a social link that's been shared. It might be scanning a QR code. Nah, don't worry about that one. Um, and once you're on the website, you might have a look at this page that you're on and do something. Ideally, you then want to do something else. You want to take a next step in your user journey. And user journeys, this is a really simple kind of three-step user journey, but user journeys can have multiple steps that involve stuff that's both on your website and off your website, such as sending emails or sending things in the post or all sorts of things like that. So it's not just limited to the things that happen inside the web browser. Here's a classic example. I was asked by someone that I work with to review a really, really simple campaign site that they'd created, where they'd created this amazing emotional video. I was like, oh, this is an amazing story. This guy's life has been changed by the work that this organization does. What do I do to support them? And there's a donate link in the header, which if you're on mobile device, um, just kind of disappears into the hamburger thing. There's a space. It's like they put this emotional video that really created some reaction within me um, with no action that I could take in response to, to that story. So try not to create dead ends. That's a little point you can take away. User experience is a process. It's not something you ever finish or get right. It starts with bidding and proposing and uh, creating project plans. Um, and it doesn't really ever end. It continues, and you can iterate upon it and continue to make your user experiences better. User experience is all of these things which I won't go into, but I do want to touch on psychology because it sounds a bit scary and intimidating. Um, but psychology, as you know from what I said earlier, I find it fascinating. If you're interested in computers, you'll probably be interested in how people work as well. Um, and it's also really important to understand because the brain has a certain set of behaviors that are common across most people. Um, and if you understand those behaviors, you can make users' lives easier and you can um, help them to do the things that you want them to do. So user experience, this brings me to my first point, which is that user experience is for everybody. We all have experiences as users. Um, this is, does anyone know what this is called? There's a particular term for this. It's a door that has a handle on the side that you push. I was going to get that wrong. I got that right. Uh, it's called a Norman door. It's such a common bad piece of bad design that it actually has a name. It's named after Don Norman, who wrote a brilliant book that you should all read uh, called The Design of Everyday Things. And it transformed my, my view of how or the things that I make. Um, and this is even worse. It's a, it's a Norman door with um, a sign on it. Um, and I'm sure we've all experienced this. We've all walked through a door. You know, you've done that walking along and, oh, there's a handle. I'll pull it clunk, 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 like that. We've all done that, right? Um, so we've all had that particular user experience. Um, we all have all sorts of other experiences of things that delight or frustrate us. I have this thing about printers. We can send, we have this science and technology by which we can send a one ton rover vehicle the size of a large car to Mars and we can land it using a hovering rocket-powered crane, but we still can't make a printer that works nicely when you, that first time or, or whatever. That's one of my little user experiences that I talk about. Hopefully, if you're in this room, you're also responsible for creating user experiences. So maybe you fall into one of these categories. User experience is for managers and it's for consultants because user experience is part of the planning and pitching and proposal process of a project. So you're important in making this work. User experience is for designers because the designer's job is to create memories and to create delight or to create emotion visually. UX is for these people called implementers who are people who use things like page builders and WordPress with off-the-shelf themes and plugins um, to create websites. You're creating page structures and you're creating calls to action and you're creating navigation and all of these things. So thinking about user experience is important for implementers. Developers, I need, who's a developer? Who claims to be a developer? Quite, maybe about half the room, okay. Developers are probably the main people who are gonna think user experience isn't for them. But I want you to think about, are you responsible for uh, social media metadata like open graph tags? Are you responsible for performance of websites? Are you responsible for implementing uh, validation on forms and feedback that goes to users on the back of that validation? 
Are you responsible for making websites responsive? Um, all of these and so many other things that you guys as developers do affect user experience. So it's great for you guys to understand how what you do affects um, people's, what people see and how effective people are. User experience is for people who create content because they are like creating the wrapper around as well as the stuff that's filled into the middle of, um, particularly with a content management system like WordPress, the stuff that you are creating. Um, like creating an emotional video that causes a reaction is a place where a filmmaker has actually played a part in a user experience. Hopefully you fall into one of those categories. Is Dave Walker here? He, oh, yes, he is. Uh, I had a slide that said UX is for cartoonists because I have a friend called Dave who's a cartoonist. I reviewed his website. It's actually really good. Um, my second point is that user experience is important, and I'm not going to dwell on this too long because I think it's fairly self-evident, but let's have a couple of things. Um, UX can make a difference, both positive and negative, and hopefully my own emotion about user experience, like printers, gah, like that. User experience makes a difference to people's lives, but it also makes you go, wow, sometimes you look at a website and you go, oh, this is so easy to use and beautiful and wonderful. I'll buy something, or whatever it is. Um, Una, who's great to follow on Twitter, I don't really know what she does, uh, but she says, um, good UI makes such a huge difference, but bad UI makes such an even bigger difference. That if we create a negative experience, that's more likely to be remembered than a positive one, but we should be pulling away from those negative experiences, trying to do things not badly at the very least. User experience can increase sales if you're building websites that sell stuff. Um, this is the classic statistic from the research that Amazon did, where every 100 millisecond delay costs 1% of their sales, which is a huge number in terms of dollars. Um, you can look up that research uh, on the web if you want to. It's a quote about performance, really, um, but I think performance is a part of user experience. Um, so that's kind of important. Here's something a bit more concrete about user interface. So Just Eat removed, they had like this single page order form with all these fancy expanding and collapsing Ajax powered JavaScript fancy blah, blah, blah stuff. And they changed it to a multi-page form that had a reload in between and tested it. And as a result, they saw almost 2 million extra orders per year. That's not pounds, that's orders. So that's, um, that's a simplification. Um, which they did and they tested, which resulted in a huge amount more money for them. User experience for the kind of clients that I work with can raise them more money. Um, so here's an example. There was a video interview with a guy from the British Heart Foundation. He simplified one of their forms, which was for donating furniture to be sold on, and they, through that change, raised an extra £2 million per year. So by asking these UX kind of questions, um, we can we can make more money for our organization or our charity or our business or our client or whoever that is. I have no concrete evidence for this, um, but hopefully you've all had experiences that make you smile, and I think that's kind of important. Um, one example might be Slack. Any Slack users in the room? Quite a few. Slack is a chat-like communication tool that's been around for about two years. When it first came out, people raved about its user experience and all the things it does. And there's now a Twitter channel, uh, Twitter user account, dedicated to tweets of love about Slack and how wonderful it is. It's so good. Imagine if the thing that you made had a Twitter account called We Love X, where X is your thing. Um, that'd be amazing. UX can change the world. Again, I don't have any concrete evidence, like statistics for this, but surely if we're happier, more effective, more productive people, um, then that steps towards bigger goals that could potentially change the world. So hopefully I've convinced you UX is important. This is where it starts to get a bit tricky. Um, user experience is hard, and as I said before, hard things are usually actually worth doing if you can get over the fact that they're hard. Um, I the whole point of this talk was to whiz you through um, a thing that I made um, that's incredibly simple um, and kind of prove the absurdity of user experience and how many questions you can ask about a very simple thing. And I'll do that in a minute. First of all, who knows what these are? Or who's used these? Facebook emojis or Facebook reactions. Um, so there's six icons that you can click and they kind of accumulate and you can see the results. Um, this was created by a team of three core designers 
they pulled in um, language experts from around the world. They pulled in non-verbal language experts um, because this is a non-verbal language that they're using. They spoke to Mark Zuckerberg. They spoke to their engineering team. They speak to designers and animators and all sorts of other people. And it took an entire year to get this from conception to actually being live on Facebook. Um, wow. <laughs> and they say it's still not finished. User experience is hard, right? This is a question that appeared on a Facebook group I'm in. Should I have a home link in my navigation? Who in this room thinks that this is a simple, innocuous yes, no question? Oh, one person at the back. Is that, is that, is that Mike? Oh, it is indeed. Um, so what was amazing about this question was it generated um, such a huge discussion. You think, it's like, yeah or no. But we had, no, people know that they click on the logo. Yes, people don't know that they click on the logo. No. People use breadcrumbs to navigate back to the home page on your website. No, people use the back button to navigate back to wherever they were before. Yes, people expect it to be there. It depends. <laughs> well, what does it depend on? Well, what about when it's on mobile and the navigation's collapsed and you can't see the link? Have you considered the user journey? Do people ever visit or need to visit the home page? Do you want to send them there or somewhere else? Test it, said somebody. I did test it, said somebody else, and people do some crazy things. <laughs> you people in this room, you are not normal. Um, I hate to say that, I hope that's within the, the scope of the code of conduct to say that. Um, you are all experienced website people and you know how these things work and you probably know that to click on the logo to go to a home page of something and get frustrated when that doesn't happen. Um, a lot of your users aren't like that. So this is a thing called bias. Try and take your own internal biases out of your thinking about user experience. Ask the questions, get other people to answer them. That's what I'm going to do later. Um, User experience is hard. Gosh, here's some research. These are two tweets that appeared within the space of about 20 minutes, retweets by Swash, Smashing, Swashing Magazine. Smashing Magazine. This says, a red button converts 34% better than a green button. Yes, go and change all your buttons so that they are red and you'll, you'll sell and make more money and everything. Oh, hang on a minute. We got exactly the opposite result a few weeks ago. UX is hard. This is, this is the whole point of this talk, really, the simplest web app in the world. Um, I've been challenged on this front, but let's go with it. Um, so I have a child. As I have two children, actually. Um, I made this thing called hasyourbabyarrivedyet.com. Um, it's along the same vein as isitchristmas.com, and is Nickelback the worst band in the world ever? ever? You don't need to write that. There's some funny stuff. <laughs> there are other sites like this. It just says yes or no. It has one function. It has one button, and you click that button, and it turns the word no to the word yes. It has this user journey. You discover the site through uh, finding it somehow, or maybe not landing on the home page, landing on the status page for a friend of yours, and you go, I need this service in my life, because in the later weeks of pregnancy, people come to you all the time, and they say, has your baby arrived yet? And you go, oh. Um, so if anyone is in that category, find me, I'll give you a card, you can sign up. You discover the website, you arrive at the homepage, you decide you're going to sign up and create an account. It has two functions really, one is sign up, uh, and then once you've done that, you log in. And this is quite important because you really want to log in from a mobile device. Because again, you're not normal, maybe you guys would take your laptop into a delivery suite to have a baby. Um, <laughs> But most normal people wouldn't. They'd take a mobile device with them, so they want to log in on that. Um, and then you hit the button and you change your status. Is Tim Nash in the room? Oh, bless him. Tim Nash has this great joke that's on my future roadmap for this product called push notifications. <laughs> Think about it, it's funny. <laughs> um, so I'm going to dash through all the questions that I asked about this thing when I created it. And, um, and we'll group them into categories, and we'll just see how crazy this simple thing that has two functions is. And if you want to go back and review the slides and see the questions that I asked and the things that I did, please do. Are we keeping up, folks? We good? I think we're good. OK. So how did the user get here? How can I get more people here? Acquisition is kind of seems easy, but those questions are quite hard to answer. Navigation is hard. What should be in my navigation? What should not be in my navigation? 
What about when I'm logged in? Do the navigation items change? Should I have a home link? We know that's a hard question. Calls to action are, well, they're mostly easy, but people tend to use them quite badly or not at all, as we've seen with dead ends. Um, so what might the user want to do next? Can I easily take action on mobiles? Can I simplify by limiting the number of choices? Blah, blah, blah. Copywriting is hard. How can I simplify? Uh, or edit this text on this page. What do I need to say? What don't I need to say? Have I clearly and so oh, blah, blah, blah. Do I need to explain this to new users or is some prior knowledge assumed? Is my page too long or too short? Are my lines too wide or too narrow? Whew. Right, mobile friendly is hard. This site is responsive, but it wasn't too hard because the design's really simple because I'm not a designer. Forms are really hard. <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. What I'll say about forms is there are things like if you're collecting an optional piece of information, is that complicating your form unnecessarily? Can you take it out and go and look at all the research that other people have done about forms and how you can make them more simple? There's lots of good advice out there. User journeys are hard. What happens now? What screen do users go to? Should the user be logged in? Do they get an email? Does an admin get an email? They're keeping up. How long are people logged in for, which is critical because you might log into your mobile device two months before you actually deliver the baby. What screen is shown after they log in? There's stuff about that. Uh, what is the button feedback? What else happens after pressing the button and so on? Um, uh, should there be an oops or undo option? I quite like one of those. Um, <laughs> This was the simplest web app in the world. It had two actions. You could sign up and you could change your status. I asked 46 questions or raised 46 points about it. UX is hard. Um, which way now? <laughs> uh, this is the roundabout that I'm named after. It really does exist. I'm in the Swindon office. Um, beg, steal, or borrow. There's lots of research that people have done, there's information that's published, there are blogs that you can follow, there are books that you can read. You don't need to be an expert at this to start learning about it and I encourage you if you've been inspired to ask questions uh, of your own about user experience to start learning about it and it's fascinating, it's really good. Oh, that re the, uh, each of these slides, these Which Way Now slides, has a resource at the bottom if you can't read that because it's too small. Look at the slides, they'll have the links on or more later. Ask questions. Your resource for this is your own brain. You've seen that I was capable of asking 46 questions about a very simple thing. Um, step back and think, like put yourself in the shoes of a user and come to your website afresh and ask questions about it and see what questions come up and what your answer to those might be. Test and observe. Testing is actually critical. It's a whole talk of its own, user testing. I've not dwelt on it much. I'm saying that your resource for this is your mum, your dad, your grandma, and your cat. Um, literally, give the things that you're creating to people who aren't technical people. You're not normal, remember? Um, give it to people who are. Hmm, that might be your mum, dad, grandma, or cat. Track and analyze. So analytics are really helpful. You can create simple analytics events that tell you when your users take actions. Um, set, set those up. Uh, so that you can see, create a home link in your navigation and then set an event to trigger when someone clicks it and see if anyone ever actually does it. There are really simple methods that you can start implementing like tomorrow to test the things that you have on your website and see if people use them or not. Change things and test them. So a bit more advanced down the user testing route. Um, Google Experiments is built into Google Analytics and is a simple way to do what's called A-B split testing. Um, where you have one version of your website you show to some people and another version that gets shown to other people and you analyze which one performs best. Um, there are other tools such as Optimizely, other split testing tools are available. And there's this design tool called InVision. Oh, I've been told it's the end, there's a few more. Um, there's InVision is a design tool that you can use to test stuff uh, before you implement it, it's great. They have a mobile app that records people's faces as they interact with your prototypes. That's really cool. Um, Think outside the screen, and my resource for this is your own experiences. So you've all had user experiences that have been good or bad with whatever those things are. Um, think that it's not just the website you're creating. Think about the emails you send. Think about if you're doing e-commerce. Think about fulfillment and all those kind of things. All these things contribute to the resource. Um, ask, discuss, and learn. I have created 
I don't want this to be the end of something. I want it, I've got a big sign here that says end. Can you hold it up and show everyone? Turn it around, because they can't see it. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is, I want to say it's a start. This is the start of a journey and a discussion for people, I hope. I created UX for everyone. There's not much on it right now, but I'm hoping to post some of the stuff from this talk and thoughts and resources and books and links on there. There's a Twitter account and Facebook page. And some of you know more about this than I do, so come along and contribute to that ongoing discussion. Um, I don't necessarily have the answers. I'm Ross Wintle, I'm Magic Roundabout. Uh, but more importantly, check out UX for everyone and let's carry on having this conversation. I hope that was fun and woke you up after lunch. Uh, I don't have answers. Are there any questions? Are you doing Q&A, Mick? Okay, I'll run Q&A. Oh, no. <laughs> Thanks, Ross. That, that's a great talk. And it's, it's, I'm a developer, and I, uh, I thought I knew how to do this stuff, and then I realized, no, I don't, until someone comes up and goes, that's not obvious. And Yay, I will. Instead of remembering, oh, I'm not the normal user. I use the internet this way, and 90% of people don't, and that's who the user is. There was just an interesting thing. I think I think it was on donor cards. They increased. I think it was in the UK. They increased uh, donors by a huge amount. And all they did was flip the question. Instead of saying tick this box to donate your kidney, your eyes, they just said tick this box to not donate. And it's those little interactions that can um, boost whatever. We we do a lot of A B and multivariate testing on our designs. I'm just wondering is there, is there ways of kind of A B testing experiences, you know, more like A-B testing those journeys, or have you done any work on that? So, so the question, if you didn't hear it, was, are there ways of user testing experiences? Um, that's a great question. And the fact that I had those slides about um, UX makes people smile and UX can change the world, I guess those kind of sum that up a little bit, that those things, probably people have done research about um, whether or not their experiences with products and things that they have um, have that kind of effect on them. But the research I did before this talk, I couldn't find an awful lot of that. Um, so, yeah, again, let's, let's carry on having the conversation. It's a really fascinating question. Taps into the psychology side of things and everything. Um, I like it. I don't really have the answer, but let's Google together and see if we can come up with some case studies of people test, testing user experiences uh, at a more general level. Um, does, is that? That's yeah, not. Yeah, no, just, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Right. Great example with the donor cards. They did the same thing on the train line where they changed the default option from buying insurance to not buying insurance. So you opted in rather than out of buying insurance for a train journey. And their dropout rate for that form um, shot down by a substantial amount and they sold more train tickets. So just changing a default on a checkbox can make people want to hang around or go somewhere else. Uh, Mike, at the back. Uh, hi. Um, not specifically a question, but just uh, uh, an example to reiterate, reiterate about thinking about the actual user's experience. So my local Asda has a lift, and somebody very thoughtfully decided to put Braille on the buttons to, uh, dis you know, so you knew which button you were pressing if you were blind. Unfortunately, the Braille disc actually isn't the button that you press. So you can read yeah. if you're blind, you can read which floor only you actually need to place the blank circle next to it. Of course, you don't know that because you can't see it. So somebody thought we need to cater for blind users, but they didn't think how will a blind user actually use this lift. So you need to make sure you think not just of the whole idea of the experience, but how your users will use it. Totally, and that taps into a great conversation I was having with Mick. Uh, he's doing, um, what are you doing? You're doing stuff in the next session you're doing the accessibility panel. He, we had a great conversation about how UX and accessibility overlap. I didn't talk about it much, but it is really important. Um, Joe Leach is an interesting guy. Look him up. He's Mr. Joe on Twitter. Um, he, he did a thing with 
um, again, going back to train tickets, sorry, I'm a train bore, um, where he observed people using the little ticket collection machines and realized that there was like a woman with a handbag like this and she had a wallet and she was holding a drink and she was trying to like tap the screen and all this. And what they ended up doing was just lowering, physically lowering the interface of this machine down lower so that she wasn't trying to hold her bag up to tap things up here. She was like just able to more naturally use that interface for collecting her ticket. And maybe that's an example of an experience that's not, it's not like it doesn't make people uh, do more or less of a thing, it just helps them to do the thing that they were going to do anyway. Phew. Oh, no, there's one more. Oh. <laughs> I, was, I was over here, wasn't I? Uh, hi, Ross. Hi. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question about, do you have any experience with any other tools? You mes mentioned uh, Optimizely and one or two other ones. Is there any other particular tools you've looked at um, that you think um, No. So I confess, like, hands up, I'm sorry. Um, I don't do a huge amount of user testing because I tend to work on smaller projects um, where they don't have budget and it's hard to convince them to put budget aside for it. They also tend to be fixed scope and fixed budget projects where it's hard to convince them even that that actually you want to have some subsequent phases where we iterate and improve on what we've built. Um, this is an issue with pitches and proposals, which is probably a lightning talk for someone to do, um, where if I were to say, well, let's do some iteration later, the initial size of my project would be like smaller, so we wouldn't use all the budget to build the initial phase, and the initial phase therefore wouldn't be as functional. Sorry, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, testing tools. Um, so I don't work on an awful lot of projects that do that. A lot of um, my, I'm in front of the screen, no, I'm not. A lot of my user experience stuff is trying to make things as the least bad that they can possibly be by asking these questions about them and by using other people's research and techniques and um, by learning as much as I can about it and feeding that into the projects that we do do. So again, UX for everyone is for all of you guys. Um, if anyone has used these testing tools more than I have, um, come and tell us what they are. Um, I'll retweet stuff from the Twitter account and paste stuff on the Facebook. Um, let's kind of continue that afterwards as we tap into the knowledge of the crowd, I guess. Cheers, thank you. I'm still not free. Oh. Hi. Oh, hello. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go on, he's had a turn. Um, I was just wondering, you were on about um, user experiences that make you smile. Uh, what's the best experience that you've had with that? What's your favorite example of uh, a user experience that makes you smile? Wow. Well, OK, not, it's hard to say the absolute best, but, and this is an opinion, um, Shopify have nailed checkout. Okay, Shopify's user experience for doing, um, like putting your credit card details in and putting your details in, is in, uh, it's just a joy to use. And it doesn't normally make me smile because I'm spending money, but it's, it's a really classic example of something that's really good. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, anyone else got a brilliant experience they'd like to share? Is that, who's that down there? Could we get a mic there? How much time, um, what's the time? <laughs> I love when the 404 pages are really funny and they don't make you feel stupid or, you know, like they make it like it's their website that's got a problem and they make it silly and makes you feel good instead of being like, oh, it doesn't work. And they help you and put like clever links so you can actually bounce back and find something. So 404 pages. 404 pages. Superb. Um, uh, Slack, another cool thing Slack does, if you've got a team on Slack and you've got like 20 people and one of them goes on holiday, and you're the administrator that pays for that team, Slack will go, oh, this person hasn't used Slack for a week. What we'll do, we'll turn their, sort of temporarily disable their account until they come back, and we won't charge you for it, and then send you an email to say, hey, we didn't charge you for this person because we didn't use our service. <gasps> Whoa, you automatically saved me money. <laughs> That's kind of, that makes me smile every time I get one of those. Uh, there's a guy here with a question, and then I think it'll probably have to be the last one from the back yeah it was kind of more of a response to the uh, user testing and multivariate uh, or a B testing 
Uh, we use Optimizely at work, and I'm not a big fan of it. It, it kind of solved the problem at the time. So what we've done is we have child pages of a page, and then when you load a page, it'll choose one of those child pages to load, and then you can weight them. So you can say, show this 50% of the time, this 10% of the time. And that whole concept is called design of, ex of experiment. It's from the 1920s. So if you want to test your website, it's just design of experiment. And then you can get the pages to compete, and you can change the weighting uh, uh, based on the Google API. So you can say, whichever one is winning, show that one more. And at the end of the month, the one that won wins out, whatever. And then you can just cover all your links with uh, click event tags. And Google Analytics lets you push 20 extra parameters. So you can pass a user ID, or you can pass like a user ID number, not their email address, and other data. So you can just test what everyone's doing and see what they're doing, yeah, and then you know. So you can build your own tools in WordPress quite easy. What's your, what's your name, mate? Uh, G Gerald. Joe? Ger Gerald. Gerard. Yeah. Gerard, hold the mic. He's taking the next question. <laughs> One more from the back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it was just a comment on user experience in a great one I had a few weeks ago. I asked my uh, asked Siri to call my new wife, um, Emily Peebles, and she always says my surname wrong. And she self-recognized that she was saying my surname incorrectly and asked me to teach her how to say my surname correctly. And I'd never heard of anyone else having that experience with that type of software before. So that was a great one. That's cool. Um, Siri and some of these, uh, there's a lot of talk about conversational user interfaces right now. Some of those are textual and some of those are verbal, but they're definitely a kind of trend of stuff at the moment um, worth looking into. And Siri is an example of where those interfaces can sometimes surprise and delight you. Uh, I'm going to have to call it quits. Come and chat to me or chat amongst yourselves afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>